we still function from an outdated model of leadership there are bosses rulers owners and then there are conscious leaders former functions purely from the intellect with a single minded goal of increasing profits by increasing productivity which results in unhappy struggling people with one eye on the paycheck and another on the weekends leaders on the other hand too care about profit and productivity but for them people come first inside them logic love mind and heart works well in harmony actually let me share with you something really interesting i discovered happiness feeling fulfilled purposeful work growing as an individual has a major impact on productivity unhappy people are not only less productive in fact they are costly for businesses according to business harvard review although profits and productivity are not the only reasons beneath conscious leadership but it's worth noting it's just another example that when you focus on yourself your own healing your own flourishing everything else falls into place by itself with that said to give our psyche a software update we have with us the charming the beautiful alexandria scooby she's a leadership coach on the mission to create human centered leadership cultures all across the globe she's a firm believer that leadership starts from within and what's missing from today's leadership is a fully developed heart set This conversation was eye opener in many ways so without further ado let's dive deep into it to set the stage of the conversation let's start with your story why you are doing what you are doing i'm like i'm very very curious about why people do what they do what motivates them okay Yeah, so I have kind of a unique trajectory that brought me to where I am today. I actually started out I joke at my first attempt at adulting, I was in counseling. Uh, I did addictions counseling for many years, so I come out of the mental health world. I worked with the Department of Corrections and in a psychiatric hospital. And so I came from, you know, a lot of seeing a lot of pain and healing and going through all that process with people. I pivoted away from that for a while and I did some restaurant stuff and then I ended up face first in tech. uh landed on my feet cuz i really enjoy the problem solving piece of tech uh, i've been in leadership position for almost 15 years as a whole but i think because of that mental health background that i have it brought into my other leadership and i bring like the trauma informed piece and being really aware that humans never stop being humans when we clock in at work we're still the same human that we were before yeah. we clocked in And I found that meeting people where they are as humans is a lot more effective in leadership and moving into coaching and specifically leadership coaching was because yeah. I saw that there was a big hole and a lot of people are still doing management which is this like top down dictation and just like driving people and creating all these metrics and just like treating people more like computers than they are like humans and mm. it really hurt my heart to see that and I was like I, I there's a better way like you don't have to manage that way And so I started researching and diving into why do people do this and why is this the norm in management and realizing it's because it's not often taught that there's another option and we often shut down the emotion and the empathy and all of the heart stuff that comes into being at work and working with people and my philosophy is turn that on be vulnerable be authentic be yourself embrace the emotionality that humans are because that's where the innovation happens that's where the the magic just explodes when people feel mm-hmm. safe and heard they show up in ways that you could have never guessed right so well, it's really really fascinating what you're doing and what we are going to like we are talking about kind of hard set and it's all about sensitivity right being vulnerable being sensitive and mm-hmm. what when we usually think about sensitivity uh, in society it's it like another word a synonym comes which is weakness mm, right mm-hmm. sensitivity is kind of frowned upon in the society so what do you think is the reason behind that oh the why behind the that i think is a pretty complicated answer um i think for a long time we've enculturated just like brute force and power being that strong and like something to look up to and like that warrior narrative and then if you pick apart some of our biggest heroes in some spaces 
like Marcus Aurelius, I think is a great example of that, that he was a great emperor and yeah, he was a warrior and he led armies and he was aware, he was highly self-aware, highly emotional aware, and he was asking himself really hard questions all the time. And so I don't quite understand where the sensitivity piece just got pushed off as weakness because to me, sensitivity and being able to see what's actually happening and feel it deeply allows you to make more well-rounded decisions, allows you to actually lead with your heart forward yeah. and make the family type decision where yeah. everybody gets cared for. Sometimes they're hard decisions and not everybody likes it and it's caring. It's with love and the intent being to thrive, but if we just push off sensitivity as, oh, that's just weakness, we're ignoring a whole part of ourselves. And I don't think we get ignored very well. I think it comes rearing back in other areas. Mm. So if you ignore it, like it's just going to show up later. Right. When, when I think about sensitivity, it's basically when I say you are more sensitive, I'm just saying you, you feel more than me. Mm. And when I think about life, another word for life can be experience, right? Life is an experience. It is a kind of a feeling. We feel all sorts of things. So the person mm-hmm. who is more sensitive in a like fascinating way is living more intense. Mm-hmm. And when I think about leadership, so a leader who's living in a more intense manner, because leadership is all about in- intensity, right? It's all about empathy because you are dealing with other people. Business is all about people. Mm -hmm. So when I was thinking like uh, about this concept, to me, it's, it was like common sense. (laughs) I didn't, (laughs) I thought like what we are going to talk about, it's common sense. Like you, business is all about people. Leader has to be empathetic. But when, uh, when I, like uh, introspect and I look backwards like what I have seen in office environments this sensitivity this heart is kind of scarce resource there Mm -hmm. are very very rare people you will find who will listen to you who will kind of treat you like a human being they will most in most places uh, places are kind of very very manipulative they play kind of villains in the office. Like if, <laughs> if you will not do uh, so, that you will be bullied and all that. Mm. And even if you got sick and you didn't like it for some reason, you didn't went to the office. So you will be bullied the next day. Mm-hmm. So from that perspective, I understand like the impact of this conversation and how necessary your work is. Mm -hmm. I want to understand your concept of this human-centered leadership. But before that, I was, uh, when I was looking onto your work, I noticed the name of your business, which is, you told me, which is just living audaciously, right? Mm -hmm. It's such a fascinating name. And I wanted to know, like, what's the story behind this name and, uh, what specifically what living audaciously means to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the living audaciously piece is that living in that boldness, Mm -hmm. stepping into your own, holding your magic, showing up as authentically you and just being that bold, unapologetic self. And especially, so most of my work is with women, women in tech, and there is a lot that happens in the tech space and a lot of other areas in which it's not super celebrated to show up in that bold, authentic self, especially as a female. And so yeah. my encouragement is for women to show up in that bold space of like, no, I'm here. I'm here to lead. I have great ideas and really taking that spot at the table. Mm-hmm. And so it's about being in that bold space and holding on to yourself and knowing that you bring value. And so it's, it's very much about empowerment and stepping into that. And so when I was trying to come up with what I, what work I wanted to do and how I wanted my intent and impact to match, it very much became about boldness and the audacious piece has been used and thrown around quite a bit and like, oh, just the audacity. I can't believe you showed up that way. And I wanted to flip it and be like, 
I can't believe you showed up that way. Like, good for you. You just came in and you held your own and you held that space Mm. and you brought value. And so almost taking the word back instead of it being a negative thing, really holding that in a celebrated empowerment piece. Yeah. In a word, if we summarize it in a phrase, it's like not holding back, right? Yeah. I love that word. And let's talk about kind of, let's try to understand this human centered. When I think about it, I remember your quote, you said leadership starts from within. Mm -hmm. Right. So what do you mean by that? Yeah. So the leadership starts from within. If we don't know ourselves and how we're showing up in the world, our values, our strengths, our weaknesses, any of those things, if we aren't actually aware of how we're showing up, then we have no idea what kind of impact we're having on other people. If we don't know ourselves and know why we're doing the things that we're doing, then how could we ever hope to change it? How could we ever hope to guide situations in ways that would produce an outcome that we actually desire? If we have no idea who we are, then everything is just happening by accident. And sometimes other people are showing up and like saving us almost, but if we actually know ourselves and we're like, oh, okay, I have this thought that leads me to act this way and I'm not showing up as my best self, then we have the opportunity to change that story and to show up differently and have a different impact. I think that humans, all of us, we want to do well and our intent in the world is to do good and to thrive and to help others thrive as well. Hmm but our intent and our impact are not always the same thing. And if we're not aware and starting from inside of ourselves, then we have no Mm. idea what kind of impact we're actually having on the world around us. Uh, This is is the core theme on the podcast that uh, everything starts inwardly. Mm -hmm. And because when we think about transformation we always this is our tendency as human beings that we think something outside should change Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. if i want to become a great leader i should acquire some like skill i should improve something outwardly i should learn how to like make people follow me right Mm -hmm. this is this is the first thing which comes into our, our mind like we have to become a kind of a manipulator <laughs> yes. okay, and force people to follow us. But what I understand from your phrase, uh, which you explained that uh, it's not about leadership. It's about becoming a leader inwardly. Right. And people will automatically like will resonate with you will kind of follow you and you can lead them. I I also like uh, heard this phrase that leaders, like we often, when we think about leaders, we think like this is the person who is walking in the front, right? But uh, I heard this somewhere, great leaders are those who people don't even know that they are leading they're Mm -hmm. kind of standing behind and they are watching you where you think that you are leading. (laughs) So what do you think about that? Yeah. To be the quiet leader who really sees things through and galvanizes people and creates that excitement about a thing, Mm -hmm. I think is absolutely a part of being a great leader. I think another Mm -hmm. thing about being a great leader is really knowing what the team needs or the community needs in a moment. And sometimes that is the person who's Mm -hmm. out in front, like spearheading it. And sometimes that's somebody in the middle who is checking on people and pushing them up and saying, you know, you got this, or I'm so glad that you did this. And I'm so appreciative of this. And sometimes it's rounding up the rear and it's holding the hands of those people who are maybe going a little bit slower and checking on them. Like, are you okay? Okay has everything at home and really bringing up that weakest link type of thing and creating Mm -hmm. training opportunities and really bolstering that person so that they can step into their own power. 
So I think being able to see what's needed right now, do I need to spearhead this and take on the brunt of this myself? Do I need to be somewhere in the middle who's helping and doing things? Or do I need to bring up the rear to make sure that nobody gets left behind? And being aware of what's happening in a moment, happening into yourself and being able to not always take the credit, having that humility, being able to be vulnerable and saying, I don't know what the answer is in this moment. Do you? And relying on your team to know things as well. And Mm. to have that team that you have your strengths, but recognizing they all have their strengths as well Mm. and their strengths, balancing your weaknesses and vice versa. That's an unstoppable team, especially Mm. when the trust is there. You can do whatever at that point, the world's your oyster. Right. And another thing, when I think about great leaders of the past is this Mm. common theme that they didn't want it to be leaders. And it's very weird to think about that. Like they were there not because they wanted to be, they were there because it was a necessity of that time. Mm-hmm. They, they had no option because nobody was like, had nobody had this courage to be in the front and take the bullet. So they had to do that. Mm-hmm. So do you find this theme in business as well? Or this is kind of, a theme in only in historical revolutions? No, I think that it does happen in business as well. But I would say more often in business, you have people who are like, oh, I want that power. I want to be the leader. And they start pushing and shoving and stepping on people. And it does become this, this top down dictation of leadership. And that's not, that's not leadership, right? That's, that's management. And that's, that's coercion. Mm. And that works for a moment. And it can be something that you can get things done. And if you actually galvanize your team and they're excited to be there and you have a why that they believe in, Mm -hmm. they're going to go a lot further. They're going to push a lot harder and they're going to rally around you in moments of need, as opposed to this, I'm here for my own Mm self-service and being able to create those communities in which everybody is excited and safe and sharing and adding value, Hmm. they last much longer. It's not a flash in the pan of a quick success that it fizzles because it's not sustainable to just drive people and manipulate people and coerce people. People, Hmm. they'll only take so much before they're like, "Mm -mm, I'm out. Like this isn't for me. So the leaders who I think last the longest and do Hmm. the best and have the most success are those same kinds of leaders who it was a moment that they needed to show up in a certain way and they, they did. And it wasn't necessarily their plan to be the leader. It wasn't necessarily what they wanted, but they were good at it and they seized a moment and then Mm. people galvanized around them. Interesting. So because the leader first started from within, like got connected with his own why his own values and what you're saying is then people with similar why similar values start following you automatically and you don't have to become this cruel vicious rude creature who's constantly dictating those people because i i get the point like for example i have people which don't have similar values similar theme similar why so I have to t- tell them and I have to dictate them, right? Because they're there for just for their salaries, right? Mm-hmm. And what you're saying, if you have a common purpose, common problem you're solving, so it becomes more easier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it becomes a conversation and it becomes collaborative. Mm-hmm. Humans like to be collaborative. We like to be in community. We like to be purposeful. Yeah. And so if you can create a community in which everybody can share their thoughts and ideas, and it's really Mm -hmm. about the best solution versus the ego solution of the person in charge who was like, nope, this is how we're doing it. Mm -hmm. Then everybody pays a lot more attention and goes just that much further to see something through because they own it. They take that ownership and that pride in it. And they're excited to see what's going to happen and what can be created. But when it's like, no, I'm the smartest one in the room and we're going to do it my way, then you just have a bunch of people who they're like, okay, sure, we can do it that way. 
and they, they aren't <laughs> yeah. bought in and they're not excited. And right. then it does, it becomes coercion and manipulation and force to get work done mm. versus just this excitement and just flourishing of ideas. Right. I, I read your blog, which uh, it was a very fascinating blog. And there, there, were, there are two things. Maybe you can explain it more efficiently than me. First is social proof. And the second is this, our need, like this authority, right? Mm-hmm. So we crave social proof. And you said that that's why there is very, very less diversity mm. in the, in this like business culture. Mm-hmm. People kind of hire people who are like them. For mm-hmm. example, if I'm an Indian, like I have, like I have a lot of people told me, like, why don't you have more Indian guests on the podcast? Mm. Right. And after reading your blog, now I understand, like, why they were saying that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> because they they are thinking like they relate to those people only. For some mm-hmm. reason, they are unable. Like I am able to relate to these people, which I am calling like as my guest on the podcast, but other people are not able to relate to those people because of social proof. It could be social proof. Uh, it could be a desire to see a more direct representation of self. Mm. And I find that until people really dig deep in themselves and they have a lot of self-awareness and Mm. who they are in the world, that it's really easy to keep it up here of who I am. And if who you are is very much connected to your culture, your ethnicity, your race, combination of those things, then yeah, you are very much just looking for that. And I, I, that's not a bad thing. I think that that's a pretty common thing. Like we want patterns and we want connection to those things and seeing ourselves in somebody else. That's super easy to do because then it's like looking in a mirror, like, oh, you look like me. You must have had a similar experience in the world to me. Mm -hmm. And that may or may not be true. That's where the questions come in and really getting curious about somebody and knowing something. Right. And so the, the two levers that I talk about in that blog that you're talking about where representation matters, that second piece mm-hmm. of that authority principle and the authority principle comes into play when we see these people who are in charge and they've got the titles and they are, you know, they're in the U S there are senators, there are Congress people, there are CEOs, mm-hmm. um, there are religious leaders we've decided as a community and as a culture that these people are in charge of things. And so then it becomes really easy to just say, oh, that's what you have to look like to be in charge because that's that top level of connection is we've decided that is what you look like to be in charge. But if we dig down a little bit deeper, being an authority figure, there's more to it than that. Being able to speak eloquently, being able to be empathetic, being able to be vulnerable in a moment and to see a problem and solve a problem, it's deeper than just that initial, what do you look like? But Mm -hmm. until we get some more people who are, what does that look like to be an authority figure from everywhere? And we recognize that we all have something to add, regardless of how we look on the outside until we actually have that balance and we can see that being represented, it becomes really hard to break down the systematic problems that we have and the systems that have been created to uphold this individual view of what an authority figure looks like. So we need to look beyond that. That'd be great if we could. And it's it's hard as humans. Like we are patternistic. We are generalizers. That's how our brains function at their, at their base to be able to survive. You have to be able to generalize, right? If you were to go open a new door and every Mm -hmm. time you came up to a door, you had to learn how to open that door. What a waste of time that would be, right? How much time would you spend relearning things? So it's great for when it comes to opening a door. Mm. It's not so great when it comes to interacting with people who are very different from one another. Yeah. Another thing I learned, like, which kind of, I got to know that I'm on the right path is when it comes to, when we talk in business context, like I'm on, like, when we think, when I think about this podcast, right, I'm kind of taking a trip into world of ideas, right? 
and the more diversity i have in in the business or in the podcast the more perspectives i have right and the more perspectives i have so we can look at some kind of problem let's say this problem this crisis of consciousness right mm-hmm. in humanity so we can mm-hmm. look at this problem from all sorts of perspective just because i am having this diverse group of people come on to podcast and share their ideas and that's what you shared in this that article and uh, shared just while ago that this is kind of one of the major benefit of diversity right yeah my experience in the world is different than your experience in the world mm-hmm. and if we can talk about what that experience looks like for each one of us we can have a deeper understanding of one another we can understand why somebody would do something if we have a little bit of background of how they've been brought up in the world and what their experience is in the space if we just assume that everybody's had the same exact experience as us it's really easy to judge them because we're like well i wouldn't do that hmm. and nobody else is experiencing the world as we are so being right. aware of that allows us to actually meet them as a human versus an extension of ourselves exactly and we we are here talking about like this merging of head and heart right mm-hmm. having this my definition of like one of the definition of intelligence is when heart and head work in harmony mm-hmm. i wanted to understand talking of perspectives like what is your perspective how how you understand this concept of heart set yeah so being a heart set is having like you just said being able to connect our minds and that logical mm-hmm. space to our hearts and that emotional space mm-hmm. humans are emotional beings we have an emotion first and then we rationalize it later and so if we actually understand what our emotions are trying to tell us and the lessons that they're trying to teach us hmm. then we can actually have a more logical thought about those emotions but understanding our heart always comes first that's how we operate as humans we can ignore right. it we can pretend like it's not true but then we're just arguing with reality and so being able to connect the two creates that trust in self and allows us to show up authentically and to be aligned with ourselves and bring every piece together fully mm-hmm. and to thrive so specifically if we talk about leadership so why it's important to like to develop the our heart set to be a effective leader If we develop our own heart set and we are aware of our own emotions and how they impact us then we can start to see how somebody else's emotions are impacting them and we can meet them in that moment of need sometimes and really recognize oh well you're struggling on this how can i support you and sometimes it's just about being there as that support system and saying i see you i see that you're being human and that you're struggling and it's okay. And then that release is that release valve of just this pressure like oh I have to be perfect I have to be perfect. But if somebody's like hey, I see you're doing the best you can. How can I help you? Then it releases that and we can actually relax and we can show up in a way that's helpful to ourselves and to others. But as a leader, if you're holding yourself super tight and you're just mm-hmm. you have all these expectations and perfection and all of these stories that happen in your mind you're then pushing those off on your team and you cause anxiety on your team and you cause them to i don't i don't know where i'm at in the world and then everybody's mm-hmm. anxious and upset and frustrated and we don't think very well when we're in those states when we're in that fight or flight we're not showing up in a good or helpful way to actually problem solve mm-hmm. So, so the more i will like i'll work on my development development of my heart set the more i'll be able to connect with my team mm-hmm. and the more i'll be able to understand what they are going through and how we can manage manageably go through this more efficiently like more smoothly mm-hmm. yeah so are there some tools some practices like you have seen great leaders doing or you suggest your clients to develop this kind of like to expand their heart yeah one of the first things that i always encourage people to do is start noticing your emotions 
-hmm. Start noticing the stories that get started in your head when you come across somebody, for example. When we see somebody and we're like, oh, they don't know what they're doing. And we just have this thought that they don't know what they're doing or they're incompetent, right? Like, well, what, what started that story? Why, why are we thinking that? And so then if we look mm -hmm. inward and we're like, what, what feeling am I having in this moment? I'm feeling maybe frustrated or annoyed because I have a need for this to be perfect. And when I perceive somebody as not working as hard as me, and that looks like them maybe playing on their computer or taking a lot of breaks, or I don't mm -hmm. see them at their desk. And then that starts a story in my head that they don't want this as much as I do. Therefore they must be incompetent. If we take a step back and we realize I'm frustrated because I have a need for somebody else to work as hard as me, because this project is really important to me, then we can actually have that conversation with that person and be like, Hey, I have a need for this project to go through and to be really solid. And mm -hmm. I really value the piece that you bring here. Can you tell me more about your engagement level? Is this interesting to you or is it not? And then we can get curious and we can ask questions. And so I really challenge people to notice your emotions and notice what stories are starting and ask, is this, is this helpful? Is this going to get me what I want? If I continue with the story, if I think my team is incompetent, does that actually set us up for success or does it harm it? And if it harms it, how can I approach this differently to actually get what I want, which is a successful project? It's kind of looking for the source of your, like the story, which is going in your head. Mm -hmm. And mostly it'll be from my, my past experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The similar experiences I have with other people. Um, like what's your understanding? Like what we are talking about is judgment, right? Constantly we are judging other people. So what do you think this from where this judgment comes from and what's the right place of, because as a leader, I think you have to have a very acute judgment also. Mm -hmm. So what's the right, because I've seen, I've often heard people saying like judgment is bad. You should not judge people and blah, blah, blah. And I, I think like when suppose someone is hiring somebody, so obviously you have to make that decision in that 20 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to judge that person. So <laughs> as a leader, what's the right place of judgment and where one should judge and where one shouldn't? Well, I think that the piece is we do judge all the time, right? And yeah. yes, judgment definitely has a negative connotation to it. And so if we just change the word and we use generalization and generalizations, like we talked about before, it's how we evolved. It's how we got here. And so understanding that we are going to generalize because that's how we operate. And that's how our brains, like we're pattern seekers. Mm -hmm. And if we slow that down just a little bit and we recognize, okay, this is a pattern that I think I'm seeing and look for truth. And so asking yourself, I have this thought, this judgment, this perception of somebody, mm. is this true? And when we're looking for, is this true? What is the tangible, recordable, observable things that tell me it's true? And you can start to challenge those stories as they're true or not. And mm. as you practice it, it gets easier and it gets faster, right? So being a good leader is about knowing yourself. It's about being mm. emotionally mature. It's about checking your biases. And so when you're that hiring manager and you're sitting in that interview and you do have to make that judgment on this person is, I think they would be a good team member fit. What does that mean? What does it mean to be a good fit on that team? So if you haven't done the introspection of what that means to be a good fit, when you have somebody sitting in front of you, then all of your unchecked unconscious biases are the ones who are actually driving that story and actually driving that decision. Right. If you've actually done the work to check on those biases, to know mm. yourself, to be more emotionally mature, then that judgment that you're making in that moment is more accurate mm. and closer to reality. I, I don't think that as humans, we actually can tell what reality is. Our thoughts are our realities and they yeah. are not necessarily the same as anybody else's.
But if we're willing to look at that and admit that to ourselves, then we can start to look for actual recordable proof of how something is or isn't true. Mm. And I think that gets us closer to reality. Right. So judgment isn't necessarily bad. If we say it another way, the less our judgment, which is less dependent upon our just our past experiences, which we haven't reanalyzed and which isn't in kind of, we haven't examined it, right? If mm -hmm. that it's true or not. Mm -hmm. So there, there is this word which is in hype, conscious. People are <laughs> adding this conscious in front of everything and calling it kind of spiritual. <laughs> so... Yeah. So let's do that. Let's like let's say uh, the leader who is whose heart and mind is working in harmony. Let's mm -hmm. call it a conscious leader, mm -hmm. right? And because we have to label things to kind of understand, right? Just for the sake yeah, of generalization. See, we've we've made another generalization. <laughs> Just for the sake of generalization. <laughs> <laughs> So, so what principles, what values you have noticed these conscious leaders, they imbibe in themselves? I would say those leaders that have delved in and done the work and become more conscious of how they're showing up in the world, they're willing to be vulnerable, they're willing to be humble, they're willing to be empathetic, and they're willing to be curious. Like being mm. able to ask questions and stay in that realm of curiosity allows yeah. answers to come and keeps the defenses down. And somebody who's willing to admit when they're wrong and take mm. responsibility for their own mistakes, it allows other people to then do the same. And so mm. leaders who are willing to be vulnerable and say, I, I don't know, or say, oh man, I thought I was right and I'm so sorry, I messed up. It allows other people to do the same thing which then we have a more honest conversation and it doesn't take as much manipulation or coercion to get things done because people feel safe and they can make a mistake and they can ask questions and they can be curious. Mm -hmm. And so leaders who can show up in that way have much more effective teams. Amazing. So uh, this is like just out of curiosity that th these values are natural or we can learn. Mm -hmm. They're, they are kind of skills which you develop. Yeah, I would say, I actually struggle to think that anything is just natural. Mm. I think that the way we're enculturated and the stories that we start as a kid and the way the adults around us showed up when we were kids goes a long way for how we show up as adults. And I think that mm. some people maybe are more naturally curious or they just had curiosity encouraged in them but I think everything can be taught. Mm -hmm. I think if we spend the time and we dedicate ourselves to learning something, we can learn whatever it is that we desire to learn. It doesn't mean it's gonna be easy. It may come easier for some people to understand than others, but I do believe that everything can be taught. That's the difference between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset, right? A fixed mindset says that all oh, the abilities I own are mine and they can't be changed. Where a growth mindset says, I want this thing, I can learn it. I just have to dedicate myself to learning it and follow through with these things. And so if you bring a fixed mindset into things, you really trap yourself and cut yourself off from a lot of growth and a lot of opportunity. You shut down things because you're, when something gets hard, then your thought is, oh, I'm not good at this. It's not for right. me. And you walk away. But if you bring a growth mindset and this belief that you can learn anything, when it gets hard, then you say, okay, this is hard. I'm, I, I just have to keep doing it. I just have to keep trying. And if you keep trying, then you learn something. And again, some people learn things better than others, right? Let's talk about great basketball players. Mm. I can dribble a basketball. I can sometimes make a basket, <laughs> but I'm not working as hard as all mm. the basketball players did where they showed up for practice every day and kept shooting those free throws and kept dribbling and kept practicing over and over and over again to become that great that we see them as. We don't really do a good job of showing all the work that comes into being great. 
like our movies and everything like that. It just shows them showing up and being amazing. Yeah. You don't see all the work behind it, Mm -hmm. but there's work every single day to become that great. If we imbibe this growth mindset, then this conscious leadership, it can be learned. And when I think about it, let's less about learning more about exploring yourself. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Yeah. So I had this like two, three words when I like I labeled like I'm the person who says I hate labels and I have labeled all, all these sets like this is soul set, this is heart set. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So just for the sake of understanding, I do that. Uh, there are no divisions between heart and mind. Like there is nothing which you can say, point out like this is a heart and this is mind. It is, we can, another way of thinking is it's a right brain and left brain. They are just labels, right? The thing is kind of your intellect and this, your emotions, this love, these have to work in harmony. And so I divided this, like I have a hard time distinguishing between soul and heart. I had this uh, two, three words, like uh, I told you earlier in our conversation, like heart is about our connections, social support, creativity and freedom and soul is about self-inquiry our relations how we are related to others like how a leader is related to his uh, employees or followers and kind of sense of meaning in life right what you were talking about a sense of Mm -hmm. purpose Mm -hmm. a common purpose which they are moving towards so from studying your work what i had added like i have added (laughs) another word in my heart set, which is emotional intelligence, Mm -hmm. right? Which I was, I think I was missing. So when you think of a emotionally intelligent leader, right? When you pictureize it, what comes in your mind? I would say the core to being emotional. I'm sorry, I ask very, very long questions and most of the part is irrelevant to the end of the question, which I'm noticing. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Like you're, you're giving background, you're giving context to the question that you're asking. So in order to show up in that connection of your mind, your heart and your soul, being emotionally intelligent is, is foundational to that. And for me, the the first step is being emotionally mature and to be emotionally mature, you have to be able to be able, sorry, you have to be able to show up and respond versus reacting. And so if you can remove yourself from a situation long enough to take that breath and say, what do I want from this? How do I want this to end? Then we can say, okay, I want this outcome. And how do I need to show up to get this outcome? Whereas when we react, it all comes from the emotion and we just, ah, we're just upset and we're just reacting in a moment and there's no thought to what the outcome will actually be. And sometimes we get what we want out of it and sometimes we don't. And we continue to respond in ways that are often unhelpful because we're reacting and we can't take that breath. So being emotionally mature allows us to actually take that breath and step back, feel the emotion, hear it, know what story started into our head and either stop it or listen to it or move through it. Mm. And then we can respond to the other person in a way that actually gets us closer to what we want versus the maybe that reacting does. And this applies to both negative and positive emotions or... Mm -hmm. It just applies to the negative ones. We are biased towards the negative ones, you know? (laughs) Yeah, I think reacting in a positive is less harmful. And so it doesn't need as much control. Mm -hmm. But the more often we can just respond and we can stay in complete control of our emotions. Yeah. The more likely we are to actually... Uh, What what I I have seen, like if... Uh, whatever decisions I have made, which I have made in a- any extreme zone, whether it's positive, or whether it's negative, I regret it later on. <laughs> <laughs> so I get it. Like yeah, this being emotionally intelligent is, which I have to learn is when I have to act and this desire to act is coming or to say something, I have to just take a pause and <laughs> let my mind settle down. 
and when, when I'm neither extremely sad nor extremely happy, then is the right moment to have a conversation or take an action. Yeah. It's, it's, it will take a lot of work. <laughs> True. One of the biggest things that I say a lot and I remind my clients of a lot is mm -hmm. self-awareness, emotional maturity, emotional intelligence, all of these things, knowing yourself. Yeah. It's a journey. It's not a destination. It's always going to be worked on. There's going to, every time you think, oh, I'm fixed. I'm perfect. Mm -hmm. I know myself. You're going to come and get hit and you're going to be like, oh, okay. I guess I have more to learn. There's always something else. It's it's an ongoing lifelong journey. Should you choose to engage with it that way? Hmm. And we don't have to. Often I, I like when I said these kind of ideals, often I start feeling bad about myself. Hmm. Like I have to be emotionally intelligent. And if I'm not acting in that way, then I'm like rather than being aware, I'm feeling bad. Like, what the hell? You had to do this, but you are kind of you are not following this set rules which you have to become the person you want to become so what do you think that's like a story yeah that's a story you've told yourself that mm. you're supposed to be perfect exactly and so if you're supposed to be perfect and you're supposed to be aware and you come across something new of oh well i'm not as emotionally intelligent as i want to be then that mm. challenge that narrative of perfect and then you're like oh well i'm not perfect but if we released that story of perfection and we took a story of i'm becoming the best person i can be every day then when we come across something new like oh i want to work on emotional intelligence mm. it's another opportunity to become a better person and they all become opportunities at that point mm. versus shortfalls and yeah. so if we can keep it in the realm of possibility and growth, mm. it's more uplifting. Right. So, like, what are some myths around leadership which you think like, should be busted immediately you've seen? Mm. That you have to know everything? That you have mm. to be the expert in the room? Okay. I would say <laughs> that have your area of knowledge mm. and the expert that you should be is the question asker. The person listening to the podcast will think like, how, how the hell I'm going to be a leader when I will not do all of this. <laughs> I thought leadership is all about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think the having industry knowledge, it's great. Um, knowing, knowing something and having an area of expertise, amazing. Yeah. And being the expert at asking questions gets you a lot further than being the expert in X, Y, or Z because other people have knowledge too. And so being able to surround yourself with other knowledgeable people allows the collective knowledge versus you having to know everything. You don't have to know everything, but it is important to know what you don't know so that you can find the person who does know it. Uh, one thing, if one lesson I have to take from this podcast is lead, leadership has nothing to do with leadership. <laughs> <laughs> it's all counterintuitive, like what you're talking about, like what I have heard about leadership. You have to become mm -hmm. this kind of alpha personality and you have to lead from the front and you have to tell people what to do. You have to be this hyper action taker, all knower. Right, always coming with right things to say, right things to act. And what you're saying is just opposite of this. Yeah, I mean, if we knew everything, then why would we need a team? <laughs> it's, it's although when you when you you have said this, now it's common sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> but earlier uh, it wasn't. So thank you so much for that. Uh, yeah. I think. It will open a lot of heart, this conversation with you. So what will be your final words? What yeah, will be your message to people who are listening to the word? Yeah, I would say know yourself, stay open, stay curious, 
we're all human. And if we just show up in the world with good intention mm -hmm. and understand that other people are also showing up with good intention, then we can all level up and the world can be a much better place. It doesn't have to be conflict all the time. Yeah, amazing. And speaking of confident intuitive, I, I wrote some, I wrote a quote from you somewhere. The foundation of cohesive leadership is communication and mindset. And I think now I understood like from communication, you mean like this hard set. Right? Mm -hmm. Communication is all about hard set. Mm -hmm. Speaking in a language of needs. Mm -hmm. If we all speak to each other in a language of needs, then we give the gift to one another to meet those needs. I think it's the great place to end this. And uh, where can we send these people who want to connect with you? Yeah, so I have my website, tolivingaudaciously.com. Uh, all my social medias, my handles are all too living audaciously. It's kind yeah. of that cheers, like, here's to living audaciously. Here's to that, being that, that's what I loved about you the most. Yeah. And I also love your definition of living audaciously. It's all about being bold. In yeah. your word. Amazing. So I'm, I'm really grateful that we did this and I really appreciate you sharing your time with us thank you so much for that and come back again sometime we we'll, i had a lot of fun learned a lot of things and felt a heart to heart connection <laughs> in the process so yes. come again we'll have fun yeah it's my pleasure thank you for having me